Jesus, God's anointed, finished his work. Time for English class. What are some of the verbs that you see up here? And are they in past, present, or future tense? So we see finished. That is the verb finished. It was finished. What God wanted Jesus to do, Jesus did it. He finished it. Now, at this time, Jesus had not finished his work when he said these words, but we live in the year 2022. No, wait a minute, 2023. And so approximately 30 to 40 AD was when Jesus actually finished his work there on the cross. Often, we don't finish our work, right? Have you seen that before? We have our to-do lists then they always get longer. They always keep going, you know, adding more to it. You know, maybe um, the Stephen Covey method, you know, the getting the different habits, the, the seven different habits of men or, you know, and he says, finish, get your to-do list, check it off, get it done. But do we ever totally finish? We really don't. We never finish that. But Jesus did finish his work. He did what God wanted him to do on the cross. And so we can imitate Jesus. We should, who all of Jesus is, all his fullness, we should be incorporating his life into ours to be more like him. And the best work that Jesus did, the best thing that he finished was the work of salvation. And now he has given us that responsibility to continue that work. And so we need to make sure that we are going to continue our work. And when is our work done? When Jesus comes again or when we die? Go ahead and read these verses. John chapter 4, verse 27, and then skip down to verses 31 through 38. I will be preaching up until verse 34 today.
So did you see it said that what God has told me to do, I must finish that work. Let's pray. Father, I pray for the sermon today. That during the preaching, it would help our hearts to be open, that we'd receive your word, that we'd hear what you have to say and take it to heart. I pray you'd help us to become more like you. I pray that as we see how Jesus finished his work, we would think of how we need to finish our responsibility as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I will give a brief summary of what we've already studied. This is the fifth sermon on John chapter 4. So remember, we looked at what Jesus said, the words that he told this woman. He, This woman said, I know that there is a prophet who is going to come. And Jesus said, I am that prophet. He said, ego a me. It means I am, I am. And where did this occur? Where were these words spoken? At a well near the town of Sychar. And this town has very lengthy history that is where Jacob put a well. And so this is where Jesus came to talk to this woman. Now this woman was from Samaria. That means she was not fully of Jewish blood. And so the Samaritans had their own religious perspective and there was tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. And as Jesus talked about giving you water that will never thirst, he said this to the woman, the woman had a conversation with him about water. Jesus said he would give her living water. And then he talks about how the Holy Spirit would come and never let her thirst again. And then Jesus brought up her sin and he said, well, bring your husband to come see me. And she said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, that's right, you don't. You have had five husbands and the man you're with right now is not your husband and then the woman changed the topic and said well you say that you have to worship at that temple and we say we have to worship at this other place and jesus said yes but there's a time coming when it doesn't matter where you worship because you will worship in spirit and in truth So, and at the end of this, after Jesus said these things, she left back to the city astounded and told the men of the town, she told them, come and see this man who has told me everything I ever did. Come and see if he is the Christ. And so the people from the village came out and Jesus spent two days there talking with the people and many of them believed him. And that continued to have an impact even throughout the book of Acts, we see that many people from Samaria were saved. So then last week I talked about that those who are saved will admit that yes, Jesus is Lord and they will share God's good news with other people as well. This woman did just that. So now we're going to turn our attention to the responsibility we have. Jesus said, I am the one you're speaking of. I am that Messiah. Now the Jewish word Messiah, the Greek word is Christ. And both of those words mean God's chosen one or his anointed one. Being anointed for performing a certain duty or responsibility. And so Jesus says, this is me. I am the one who is anointed. He had a heavy responsibility to bear. Would you like to have the same job that Jesus had? No, no one would want that. What an incredible responsibility. No, no matter, no matter what other jobs you can think of with a heavy load, Jesus' burden tops them all. Near the end of his life, in John chapter 17, Jesus was praying in the garden and he said, it's not my will that needs to be done, but it's your will. I'd rather not go through this. This is my condensed version. I'd rather not do this. I'd rather not go to the cross, but I know that it is your will that must be done. And so I will do your will. 
Can you imagine the burden that Jesus had? That he was praying so intensely, he sweat drops of blood. And Jesus finished it. He completed his responsibility. And so that's what we're going to be emphasizing today. That God's perfect timing, he has perfect timing in the giving of responsibility. You know, we like to talk about divine appointments, that God has already put down everything that's going to happen in your life. He has arranged everything and worked it all out. And at this moment, when Jesus met this woman at the well, God knew about it. He wasn't shocked. When something happens in your life, God is not shocked. He already knows because it's a part of his plan. In verse 27, it says, at this point, at this time, at this time, the disciples came. Now, they came and they were shocked that Jesus was speaking to this woman. At this point in time. Now, in verse 26, what had just happened, or verse 25, what had just occurred? Jesus told the woman that I am the Messiah. And it was at that moment that the disciples came. God's timing is perfect. God was not surprised. He worked everything out. Remember when Jesus came to the well, he came at a specific place. He came at a specific time. It was at noon, right when this woman would have been coming out. This woman who had such a sinful life. And Jesus came to meet her at the exact right time. And so at this point, the disciples come. That was the right time. You know, it could have been five minutes ago. If it had been five minutes early, maybe the woman would have gotten nervous and left, right? But Jesus had already told her about how she would worship in spirit and in truth. And she had time to realize that she needed to repent and that she needed to understand who Jesus was. And that's when she went back to the village. And that was the right time the disciples came. You have to trust God's timing. We'll look at another example from Moses. Remember, we preached through Exodus several years ago. As Moses grew up, uh, his upbringing did not surprise God. In fact, God worked it out. Remember that at Moses' birth, Moses' mother was afraid for him because he was supposed to be killed. Remember, the Pharaoh of Egypt said that all Hebrew boys must be killed. And so she was able to hide him and protect him. And she built a basket and sent him out on the river. And at the right time, one of the princesses of Egypt was there. And God allowed that princess to raise Moses. And he was educated in Egyptian culture and, and ways. And then at the time when he was 40 years old, he murdered an Egyptian taskmaster who was beating on a Hebrew slave and he went and stayed for 40 years out in slave, uh, out in the desert when he ran away and that's where he met his wife and at the right time he met Jethro his future father-in-law who gave him great advice God met Moses in the desert in a burning bush on a mountainside at the right time God worked everything out. And then at the right time, Moses went back to Egypt to save the people. God used that to save his people and bring them out of Egypt. It all happened according to the right time. Moses tried to control his timetable, but God worked it out instead. Here's another person's example. Esther. Esther. Now, if you find this book, it's a very good book. I encourage you to read it. I have not preached or taught about Esther. I should do that soon. Add it to that growing list. But um, in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, Esther was a Jewish woman who married a Persian king. Now, he was not Jewish. He did not know about the Jews. But there was a man who hated the Jews. His name was Haman. And he convinced this Persian king to kill all the Jews. And Esther had an uncle named Mordecai. 
He told Esther, you've got to do something. And look at what Esther says. Look at what Mordecai says. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come for the Jews from another place. We will be delivered from this, but you and your father's house will perish. So who knows, maybe you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And Esther said, okay, I will pray, I will fast about this. And she came to the king and details were arranged so that she was able to help save God's people. It was all according to God's timing, it was perfect. And then see Christ himself, he came exactly according to God's timing. He came to the right place, the right time, the right people. And if you're taking notes, we've got five rights there. The right, you know, when you're taking medication, you have the five rights, something like that. The right dosage, the right medication. I've, you know, I have to know all that through work. But anyway, God has his right timing. And God worked it out completely. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, at the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. That's the Jewish law. And according to religious practices, this all happened at the right time. In John chapter two, Pastor Hollenbeck preached about this recently, I think just a month or two, uh, about a month ago on a Sunday night, how Jesus was at the wedding in Cana and he turned water into wine. And Mary said, Jesus, this wine has run out. What, what can we do about it? And Jesus said, woman, what do I have to do with thee? My time is not come. My time is not yet here. My time is not yet, it's not time yet for me to be revealed as Messiah. But he went ahead and performed this miracle, turning the water into wine. And again, in John 7, verse 6, Jesus said to them, My time is not ready yet, but your time is always ready. And again, Jesus spoke when he was in the treasury, as he talked at the temple. And no one laid hands on him because his time had not yet come. The Jewish people tried to take Jesus and kill him. They tried to get rid of him. But God prevented them because Jesus' time had not yet come. Alex, remember we were talking about the book of Revelation. We don't know when those things are going to be. And so we just have to trust him and trust what he says and keep living our life trusting God with his timing. In John chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, just before that, Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should go from this world to the Father. And he loved his own, that's the disciples, he had loved them till the end, but he knew it was time. In John 17, this is when Jesus is praying alone. Jesus spoke these words and looking up at heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come glorify your son that your son also may glorify you boy I wish I could have seen that conversation between the perfect son and the perfect father makes me miss my dad he was not perfect no but this precious moment of conversation how the father loved his son and the son loved the father and Jesus says now the time has come it is it is here now So all of this timing, God is responsible to work timing out in his way. But now we have this shocking responsibility. What's so shocking? So at this point, the disciples came. I remember this was at just the right time. And they saw Jesus talking to what? A woman. Oh, that is just shocking. That was something to marvel at. Just amazing. What, Jesus? You're talking to this woman? I mean, they just, they were astonished. They were left speechless. 
They had nothing to say. They couldn't even ask Jesus about it. Now it's interesting. Who is writing the book of John? The Apostle John. He was one of them, obviously. He knew their thinking. He's like, what are you doing, Jesus? Why are you here talking to this woman? You are a teacher. You know, and this was a sad thing, but back in this day, rabbis did not waste their time with women. That's what it says. It says that rabbis, I mean, that's very offensive. If we heard that today, we'd be like, what? That is not okay. But rabbis were not encouraged to speak with women. It was considered a waste of their time. Uh, that's just, it's wrong. <laughs> very wrong thinking. Uh, and so these men are saying, Jesus, what are you doing talking with this woman? Jesus' responsibility was shocking to the disciples. He was responsible to save all. That was not uh, in agreement with Jewish mentality. You know, we say, oh, we have to explain to the gospel to the deaf only. No hearing people allowed. Is that right or is that wrong? That's wrong. The gospel is for every preacher. So this was a shocking breach of societal nor societal norms, a shocking breach of tradition that Jesus was there talking with this woman. And also, these men were left so shocked they couldn't even ask him, what are you doing? They, they, they were left speechless. They saw the situation and they had no idea how to say, how can, how can we even respond to this? Yeah, they left speechless, just no words. You know, the gospel should be shocking. The gospel can save everyone who believes. That's it. It, it. The rest doesn't matter. That is a shocking statement. Shocking reality of the gospel. That should shock you and I. And it, do our actions show that? You know, maybe we think, oh, I can't tell the gospel to that person because, you know, that person wouldn't be saved. But every person needs Jesus Christ. Even the hardest headed person, even the meanest person in the world needs Jesus. And that person can be saved. You know, I could say so many stories of different Christians throughout the ages who were saved. And, it, you know, Saul is an easy example. Saul. Peter. Peter, too. Uh, you know, this. The fisherman, this stinky, sweaty fisherman who is saved. God saves those who believe. Do you believe that? You say that you nod your head, you say that, now show it. Show that anybody can be saved. So how can they believe if they haven't been told? You know, cannibals, people who eat other people. You know, back in the South Pacific, missionaries would come there and explain the gospel, and that practice ended. They were awful people. They would kill others. You know, there was a missionary named John Patton. He went to the South Hebrides. It's a different name now, but a missionary from Scotland. He went there to preach the gospel to headhunters. That was a group of people who would kill others and eat them. And he preached the gospel to them. In India, you know, when we think of uh, how men would, when a man would die, his wife was killed along with him. William Carey from England was burdened for the people of India, and he came and explained the gospel. And many, after many, many years, there were only a few people saved. He labored for many, many years. He worked to translate the Bible. And the fruit now is still continuing there, his work. But God can save awful sinners. You know this verse we've, I've preached on before that says, Everyone who is in Christ is a new creature, whether Jew or Greek or barbarian or Scythian, men, women, it doesn't matter for all are in Christ. The church is for anyone. Anyone who is saved can follow the Lord. 
Jesus has had this responsibility that was more important than physical needs. Does that mean that Jesus starved himself? No. But Jesus knew that this responsibility was more important than food. Look at verses 31 through 33. In the meantime, remember verse 27, the disciples came and they saw Jesus talking with this woman. And then verse 28, that's what we talked about last week, how the woman left her water pot and she went into the village to get people to come and told the men of the village, come and see this man who's told me everything. And so they came out. So we see verse 31 says, as the woman went into the village, in the meantime, the disciples were concerned for Jesus saying, Rabbi, you need to eat. Remember, Jesus was with his disciples and as they were traveling, the disciples went off into a nearby town to buy food. And Jesus sat at the well talking with this woman. And so as they brought this food back, you're like, here, Rabbi, eat, you need to eat. So of course the disciples were concerned concern for him. You know, it's, it's a blessing to be concerned for others. But Jesus' answer was a little bit odd. He said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Now, if Jesus said that to you, you, you brought him some food, and you're like, here, Jesus, go ahead and eat. And he said, I already have food that you don't know about. What would you think about that? You'd say, how did you get food? Where, where did that come from? How, how did that happen? We've been out looking for food and then you already have some what? What are you talking about? You're here talking with this woman. How, where did you get your food from? They were confounded by this. Again, they're thinking of their physical food. And that's what the disciples said. They said, so someone else brought him something to eat? You know, while we were out, getting our food someone else gave him something how could he have already eaten and jesus okay let me back up here so remember that jesus was using a metaphor he used the thing to represent a spiritual reality remember jesus used the water to talk about spiritually having a changed life in Christ. And so in the same way, he uses this metaphor, this food metaphor, to talk about doing God's will, following what he wants. So Jesus used a similar metaphor with both these groups of people, the woman and then the disciples. Remember, the woman said, Oh, you have living water? Oh, give it to me right now, and then I'll never have to come get water here again. And the disciples did the same thing. They said, wait, you already have food? What? What's going on? So we already talked about this verse about the living water. And so just like the Samaritan woman, the disciples also missed the spiritual point. Jesus said that this living water will spring up and be life everlasting. Now later she did get it. But so now when Jesus makes this comment about bread, the food, I have food to eat which you don't know about, the disciples were confused, they were puzzled. Until later Jesus explained and that's what we have to wait for next week. I mean in the next, we'll talk about that more next week. So the woman had said, sir, how are you going to get water? You, how can you get the water? And then she was puzzled by his statement. You know, and then she said, give me this water that you have and I don't have to keep coming over here and carrying, come fetch the water anymore, I want this water. She was thinking of that physical there. Now, just like what Moses said, Jesus was showing that spiritual food was more important. When Moses, Moses made a comment that 
also Jesus reflected in his comments that food is important, yes, but God's food is more important. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Moses stated that God humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna. Do you remember what manna was? Remember the word manna means, what is it? The stuff that God provided. When the Israelites were traveling through the wilderness for 40 years, God provided this food for them. He said, you did not know what this was and your fathers had never seen this before. But he gave it to you that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone. Can you live without food? No, you can't. You know, I think, what, like three days, right? Something like that. Three days. That's... Switch. <laughs> he said, water, you can live seven days without water. Well, no, 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 it's three days without water, more without food anyway. You can live several days without either of those, right? But ultimately, you have to have those. You have to have food and water for life. But these also have a spiritual meaning, physically transcendent, that I understand that you need your physical needs met. Yes, I understand that. If you don't have your physical needs met, then it's hard for your spiritual needs to be met. I get that, but are you depending only on your physical needs? We are to depend on every word from the mouth of God. And where do we find that? That's right here. This is what God's talking about, or what Moses is talking about. Every word from the mouth of God, every word that God says, including the ins and the thus, every word that God gives to us is of such spiritual importance. Food is important, yes, but even more important is our relationship with God and being able to feast on his word. In John chapter 6, we'll get more into that about God's word. So Jesus answered, remember when he was tempted, he had gone for 40 days without food. I mean, that's, that's incredible, 40 days without food. Now, remember that Jesus is the perfect man, right? I, could we try 40 days without food? I don't recommend that. I don't re recommend you try that. Right, Lance? Not, not something I recommend. Uh, maybe you've got a secret back there. I don't know. Secret stash. I mean, where, you know, where's all the food that I hid away? <laughs> but um, Jesus went 40 days and nights without food. I think Elijah did that also once, but then God provided him some food um, that satisfied in him, and he was able to go in that strength. Anyway, the devil came along to tempt Jesus and said, look, look at these stones. You can turn them into bread. You know, maybe Jesus was starting to hallucinate a little bit with from his lack of food, and the devil's saying, look, these stones, look, this is like perfect brown, crusty bread. See, you have the power to just make the stone become bread and you can eat it. And Jesus said, no, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And where did Jesus get this from? From the book of Deuteronomy. He reiterated what Moses said. And that should be our food, our spiritual food. Now, I'm, I will get into John chapter 6 with talking about the bread of life. But right here, this is mentioned how Jesus said he needed to finish his father's work. He needed to do his father's work. So now we see that we have a clear responsibility. We can't argue it away. We can't add conditional clauses to it. This is a very clear responsibility that's been given. The disciples were like, Jesus, we have food for you to eat. Here, eat it. And Jesus said, no, because I'm trying to teach you something. Again, that we'll get into this more next week, but my food is to do the will 
of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food is two parts. My responsibility is two parts. Is that clear? That's extremely clear. There is nothing vague about this. Jesus said, this is my responsibility. My responsibility is to do what God wants, do the will of God. And look, we can see many other verses that say the same thing. John chapter 6, Jesus said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Do the will of him who sent me. Jesus said that phrase many times throughout the Gospels. You could read them and count them up there. Jesus was never unclear about who sent him. He said, God sent me. And then he says, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, everything he's given to me, I should lose nothing. Those who are saved, I will keep them and I will raise them up at the last day. That's clear. You know, maybe the disciples didn't understand that. If I had heard it, I probably would have said, what is Jesus talking about being raised up at the last day? But Jesus knew his responsibility. He knew it very clearly. He knew that the Father had given all those who were saved to Jesus. And at the last day when Jesus comes again, that every single person would be raised again. And that was Jesus' responsibility. But in order for that to happen, he had to die on the cross. So Matthew chapter 26 says Jesus left his disciples, went further to pray. He had told them, you know, you pray, you watch. And he prayed. He went on his own. And he bowed down to the ground and he prayed and he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. Now this cup in the Bible, if you look at the cup. The cup is often a symbol of judgment. How are grapes made? Remember, you know, people would drink wine, right? So when we talk about the cup, that would be wine in history class. I just talked about, taught my students in history class that they would use their feet to stomp out all the grapes and to squish the juice out of the grapes. And that's what they would do. My students were like, oh, that's so disgusting. Yeah. Well, you know, the fermentation probably kept it clean, but you would stomp and stomp and get all the juice out of those grapes. And then there would be little bits of, you know, skins or things like that that would fall down into the juice. And the juice would be mixed with water usually, and that would be poured off into the different containers. And you would drink, and if you drank it all the way down, there would be those little bits of like skins or seeds or whatever. You know, I like making smoothies with berries, but then at the very end, there's like all those little bits of skin, you know, I get those little pieces of skin stuck in my teeth. You know, it's pretty amazing. There's, it can't chop up the seeds of the berries. They're so small, right? And that's a picture of God's judgment that all, that God's wrath crushes his enemies, that God punished Jesus because of our sin. God knew, or Jesus didn't want this. He knew it was coming. He didn't want it, but yet he had been given this clear responsibility to go through with it. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, being found in appearance as a man, Jesus came to earth. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even at the death of the cross. So Jesus' responsibility was to finish his work. And we'll look here at some scripture references. The word finish means to complete, to perfect to do the whole entire part, the whole entire job, that's to finish. Bring it to completion. What God had planned was to be totally completed. And so Jesus said here, with that word, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete to the uttermost his work.
And he said, but I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. He's given me that responsibility. These are the things that I'm doing. And the works that I do prove, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Is there any doubt that Jesus is God? Well, look at his works. He gave healings, he saved people, he raised them from the dead. But his most important work was that of the cross and then the resurrection. And that showed who Jesus was, that he came from the Father. There was no question about it. Again, in John, the last night of Jesus' life, he says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. All of the things that I've done, teaching the 12 disciples. Remember, Jesus said that God, he told the disciples, God sends you now. These 12 disciples are part of the share and responsibility that God has given. Jesus said, I finished the work. That doesn't mean the work is actually totally finished. It's still his part in the process was done. He started the work and what he was supposed to do was done. And Jesus declared that the next day he shouted out, it is finished. After he had tasted the sour wine, he cried, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. Jesus completed the responsibility God had given him. I don't mean that he was stuck, but he worked every part out. Not one part was missing, not one hair, not one little detail was missing. Jesus finished every bit of responsibility that God had given him. Thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord for your salvation, that your sins are not removed in part, but the whole, all of them have been nailed to the cross at that moment. So now, something for us to consider. God has perfect timing for all of us. Are you saved? God knows. Will you be saved? God knows. Teenagers, if you think, oh, I don't know what I'm doing with my future, God knows. He's got it worked out already. It's already done. It's already decided. His timing is perfect. Now, even if you're 70 or 50 or 40 or whatever, God, God knows. So are you trusting him? Are you confident that God knows what the future holds? But we still constantly say, oh, you know, what do we do? What do we do? Wait for God's timing. It is always perfect. Do we always think that everything is good? No, sometimes we feel like life is gone awry, but God has a reason for that. Also, remember you are not limited to just your physical <laughs> senses, you know, your gut feelings. That is not the limit. You're not just only about food and the physical life, God has made you more important than the animals. You have a soul. You can commune with God. And if you're not doing that, you are missing out. You are missing out completely on what God has designed you to do. When God made Adam, what did he do with him? He breathed the breath of life into Adam so that he became a living soul. All other things that God created did not have that. Only Adam was oh. given that breath of life by God. I am almost 43. So almost 44 years ago, I was conceived. I came to be, came to be Brian Levens. God wasn't shocked with that. My parents probably were shocked, but God wasn't. <laughs> He's deaf. Great. 
you know, maybe all of your parents were shocked when you were born, I don't know. <laughs> or curing or whatever. Coda, what have you. But God knew. Nothing surprises him. When you were saved, maybe the person who explained the gospel to you, God was not shocked at that. And so now, do you know that you have a responsibility to tell the gospel to others? Yeah. And all things will happen according to God's perfect timing. You know, God has given you very clear responsibilities. He doesn't leave it a mystery. He says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you to the end of the world. That's a pretty clear responsibility. That's just one of them. In the Second Thessalonians 5, 8, it says, This is the will of God that you abstain from sexual sin. Uh, that's not vague. That's very starkly clear. That this is God's will. That's just one example. You know, all the years I've been teaching and preaching, God wants us to do what he said. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. What God requires of us is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's Micah chapter 6, verse 8. That's very clear. This is a responsibility that God has given to us. God gave Jesus a responsibility, and now the responsibility he's given to us, we need to finish it. You know, it's amazing that God would use us sinful people, but God can use every one of you, that God can use me. You just have to be willing and say, yes, God, use me, use me change my life. Help me become more like you, Jesus. And we'll close with this verse. Paul in 2 Timothy said, or in Acts, he said, but none of these things move me. I do not consider my life dear to myself that I may finish my race with joy and that the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, which is to testify to the gospel of the grace of God, and in 2 Timothy, this was the last letter that Paul wrote before his death. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And in Psalm 40, verses 7 through 9, I like this verse. It says, Then I said, Behold, I come. In the book of, in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. Verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Verse 9, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, but I tell, O Lord, you know. How many of us can say the same as that? How many of us can say that? We have a clear responsibility. God chose Jesus to finish his work, and so we can also. We can do that with God's grace, with a desire to serve him. Yes, we will make mistakes. Yes, we will have our ups and downs. But do we continue until he takes us home? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us in our time of reflection that we would surrender to you. Help us to see that Jesus was chosen to finish your work. Help us to understand that even though we have our limited physical abilities, help us to understand that our spiritual needs are much bigger than our physical needs. I pray that you change us to become like you. In Jesus' name, amen.